You're listening to the Gridiron Wine Podcast, where three girls, two Brits, one Yank, discuss the beautiful game of American football whilst drinking delicious wine. Enjoy the show. Welcome back to Gridiron and Wine. I'm Liz Mandari from NFL Girl UK and I'm joined by my co-host Dana from Alto Football and Shona from 99 Yards. How is everyone? It's been a while since we last spoke. I think in May was our last chat. What's um, what's new with everyone? Absolutely <laughs> nothing. Nothing. Yeah. Nope. Literally nothing. Um, no one's got anything exciting to say. <laughs> I've been running. I spent a lot of time in Asda, which is Walmart in America. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I have been at work. The hospital's finally getting busier. But other than that, nothing. Because the rest of America is chaos and crazy, but we've decided to just stay home. <laughs> so that's what we've been doing. So yeah, like the rest of the world, there's not much going on. No, fair enough. Well, I'm getting a dog, which I'm very excited about. Yay. So little Pierre comes home in August, so um expect nothing but puppy pictures. <laughs> Pierre is a dog. I have a dog named Kevin, so I totally Love understand. It. <laughs> you gotta do it, right? You gotta do it. What a great I've name. actually been <laughs> trying to convince my boyfriend to get a dog because he has his own house and I'm like, I think we should get a dog. Bear in mind, my boyfriend lives two hours away from me. And he was like, I, I'm not getting a dog. We don't live together. And I'm like, no, but you could get a dog and when I come, I can walk it. <laughs> He's like, no, it's not happening. <laughs> so oh, convenient. <laughs> I'm like, I'll be a part-time mum. He's like, no. No. <laughs> Oh man. Well, listen, we've got loads we want to discuss about today. So we're talking all about money and <laughs> the impact of coronavirus on the league as well. So uh, let's get right into it on Pat Mahomes. So earlier this week, he agreed a 10 year deal with the Chiefs with 503 million. So he gets 477 million in guaranteed mechanism. Um, the ability to have out if the guaranteed mechanisms aren't exercised. There's no trade clause. Uh, first half billion dollar play in sports history history made crazy <laughs> it's it's a little uh overwhelming <laughs> let's just put it that way i think that we knew patrick mahomes was going to take you know the the top seed with you know money in the nfl i don't know that we really thought that he was going to take the top spot in money in sports in general <laughs> that is never happened with football. Um, baseball has always been the king of that because they played stupid contracts for years. And so it was like, I, I, I think that that was a shock to everyone. I think too, the bigger shock was the length of the contract. Yeah. The NFL doesn't time. do contracts like that anymore. Players stopped doing those contracts 15 years ago because they realized that they often outplayed their contract. And so yeah. why would you lock yourself down for 10 years? So that was also a huge surprise. And we have to remember this is technically a 12 year deal, not a 10 year deal because he still has mm. two years left on this current contract. Although yeah, there were course. some changes made to that too, but I, I not going to lie. Flabbergasted was the <laughs> word that came to mind for me. I don't know. What do you think, Shona? I mean, I'm not normally one like who doesn't have any words as you well know. <laughs> But when I saw that, I think I was silent for like a good two minutes because I was just like, this is so shocking. And I, I think I saw a tweet that you did, Dana, that a lot of people spoke to you about, um, you, we have doctors and nurses who don't get paid this amount of money. And this guy is playing football and earning an substantial amount. I mean, he, he uh, my wage doesn't even cover like, doesn't even dent his new deal. <laughs> like, yeah, you know, they did say there was a great tweet and it said basically someone making $50,000 a year for their entire lifespan won't make as much as he makes in one game. And I think that that is something that 
um, has hit a lot of people really hard in these particular times. I think that had this been a year ago or two years ago, we would have heard a few people saying that, but I think we're hearing that backlash a little bit more. But I want to say this, ladies, th this has not, this is not, this has nothing about Patrick Mahomes. I am a go get your money kind of a girl. I'm all about the players getting the cash because I feel like, in my opinion, they deserve it a heck of a lot more than the owners do. So I am totally okay that they're, you know, about him getting this money because in turn, we have to keep in mind that he then makes money for people. So it is, it, it's a little different situation, you know, than the average worker. It, it doesn't mean that he's more important than our first line workers, our healthcare workers, our teachers, none of that. Of course, we all know that. Um, but that is another four hour long debate that you could do another time. But if you're talking about this, you know, directly at first I was like, Patrick, what are you doing? This t locking yourself to one team for that long and not having any say. Then as the details came out, my whole brain shifted to Kansas city. What are you doing? <laughs> because it was like, it, it was, you look, there's no trade clause. He has to give permission for a trade and the team. He has to okay both of them. That's in there. There's no percentage to the to the salary cap, which everyone's like, oh, it'll be fine because we're going to make, you know, in 10 years, the cap will be huge. Yes, but next year that cap's going down. And so it's going to be interesting to see how that, and how are you going to justify a $60 million cap hit in three years if the rest of your team can't keep up? Now, I am not a you know, financial guy, I know they went through all the numbers. I know Kansas City's front office is really smart. I trust them. At the same time, and I said this on the Our Turf podcast, and I'll say it again here, and I'm sticking with it. At some point, this contract will be regretted by someone. It will be regretted by Pat. It'll be regretted by the Chiefs. Maybe it'll be regretted by the other players. We have to remember the impact this is going to have on other players and other teams. And so this, I love Patrick Mahomes. He's the sweetest kid. I've been lucky enough to chat with him. He is so fantastic. And I, this could not have happened to a better guy at the same time. I still truly think at some point in this 10 year span, there will be a regret around this contract somehow. It's just crazy. I think like you say, it's, it's a lot of money and it kind of like sets a bit of a precedent. Like this is what will become the new normal. Like, this can't be normal surely <laughs> right and how does this impact other teams you know the dallas cowboys were like christ that is not what we want you know what i mean they got to deal that with that Dak's like <laughs> yeah <laughs> he's like give he, he's like show me the money like <laughs> the thing of it is, is Dak prescott is not patrick mahomes and we know that but does that mean he's like well you gave him that much i want in the middle there a little bit you know what i mean yeah. so it's there will be waves of impact for a very long time, I think. Yeah, definitely, yeah. I mean, at least he knows he will never, ever not go out with his, out with his tomato ketchup. Right. <laughs> Forever. Never. Forever. With ketchup. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and I look at it this way, too. The other team players on his team, they were like, oh, good for you. Couldn't happen to a better guy. We're so excited. Will you tell me that Chris Jones is saying that right now? Because they did Patrick Mahomes' contract before they did Chris Jones' contract. They franchise tagged Chris Jones. To me, this says, Chris, we're going to use you one more year, which he said he will not play unless he gets a new contract. And then you're out because, you know, we're not going to have any cash to pay you. <laughs> like, yeah, it's just crazy, isn't it? Yeah, it's so not. It it's but kind congratulations of to Patrick and his family. This will change his family forever. So this is I saw I saw another funny tweet um about his girlfriend being like <laughs> basically oh. way make him his, her baby daddy like as soon as <laughs> <laughs> lock that up. <laughs> the thing of it is is I and the snarky girls on my Twitter and I get this, we're like, no wonder he didn't marry her first, because now that prenup will save him. <laughs> so it's like you know, yeah, we, yeah, we you know, that's, that's their issue, I guess. They've been together, you know, forever. So we'll see. yeah. Yeah. Those snarky girls are so fun, aren't they? They're like, Oh, remember <laughs> Russell Wilson's wife. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's true. And then I guess another contract that we should talk about is, uh, Cam Newton's contract with the Patriots. So 
From what I was reading, so it includes a 3.75 million in playing time incentives and a maximum value of 7.5 million if the team wins the Super Bowl. Now, apparently, he earned 121.4 million during his nine year career with the Panthers, which included being uh, the 2015 MVP and he led the franchise to Super Bowl 50. So, I don't know, that to me is pretty harsh. I was with Richard Sherman on this when he tweeted out that um, the deal was disrespectful. Um, I don't know any other MVP who would play on that contract in the league. Obviously, Cam um, wanted to get back into football. As Dana said, we knew he was going to go to the Patriots a while ago. Um, It kind of just fits the mold. And I can totally see Cam and bill belichick like doing amazing things there and it kind of makes me a little bit sick um (laughs) but but there's less talented qbs that are getting um 15 60 million a year and he's getting less than that i'm just kind of like a bit speechless about it but i can understand at the same time like why cam has accepted it and it's it's bill belichick again isn't it the guy is the guru he knows how to do contracts like this he's not he's not daft there's a reason I call him the Sith Lord because he <laughs> manages to grind these out and everyone's like, how has he done it? And I'm like, well, it's Bill, you know? <laughs> yeah, it is real true. I, <sighs> $120 is what he made over his career. Is that like one season for Patrick Mahomes? Now I can. I can yeah. <laughs> so, you know, here's, here's the, the interesting thing. Cam Newton is now playing with a boulder on his shoulder, not a chip on his shoulder, a boulder on his shoulder. And he was like, all right, none of you other teams think I'm worth it. Well, well, I'm going to take this pity little deal because that seems kind of like what it is. And I'm going to turn around and I'm going to win another Super Bowl. I'm going to win a Super Bowl with the Patriots. And, And the rest of us who understand Cam Newton and how good he is, people, I mean, they're talking about his injuries and all this stuff. He was literally injury injured for one and a half seasons. The rest of the time, all that crap he did, he wasn't injured. He he was fantastic. He just had a really crap line standing in front of him. Well, now he's got the New England Patriots line in front of him. Yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> Freaking New England. Here we all thought for sure they were going to take a step back and the Bills were going to take the division. I don't think so anymore. I think uh-uh. they're a real contender. With the rest of the weapons, oh, Bill, it's like, come on. Why does he always have to win? <laughs> I can't decide if I want Bill Belichick or Tom Brady more to fail. I don't know why they can't both fail. That would be better. But so anyway, the point is, <laughs> the point is this. Cam Newton has the opportunity to go and play for a football genius. Yes, it's hard to say, but it's the truth. And he gets to come back and prove that he's still as good as he ever was before. Because remember, he was the wonder kid for so long. You guys remember? I mean, yeah. yeah. And now he gets to go and prove here, you know, that he can still be the guy. Now, this is a, this is a loner, maybe. I always thought this is a one-year deal. He's just going to come in. He's going to try and save a couple of things, you know, with this team and make the transition better to the new kid. Cam Newton pulls this off. They might give him a new contract for a few years down the road. It's not like he's old, you know? Yeah, exactly. So it'll be interesting to see what happens there. He, he, really what it comes down to is this is Bill Belichick's way of saying, no, all those Super Bowls are thanks to me. Oh, you yeah. know, with the whole <laughs> Belichick-Brady thing, you know, and there's nothing against Tom Brady. I think that he'll do fantastically down in Tampa because I think Bruce Arians will use him wonderfully. But – this is Bill Belichick putting his stamp down and saying, you know, I'll go, you're not going to let me look stupid here. I'm going to do this. So we'll see. I'm thrilled for Cam. I think it's going to be, I think that the rest of that division took a deep breath when they saw Cam Newton in New England. I read a stat, which is incredible. Out of all 32 starting um, QBs under center come this season, only one has managed to beat Bill Belichick. Um, is undefeated against Bill Belichick, and that is Cam Newton. And that's probably one of the reasons why I went to get him. (laughs) Yeah, definitely, yeah. That's really cool. (laughs) That is very cool. We now have the Dark Lord at his apprentice. (laughs) Right. He's He's gone through, you know, he's gone through Darth Maul, and he's done (laughs) um, Count Dooku. Now we have Darth Vader with his lord. (laughs) (laughs) We've got a oh, podcast right here. 
I'm telling you, the Patriots, they just don't go away. <laughs> no, I know. That's it. I think we'll never, we'll never stop hating them, will we? <laughs> No, I mean, I thought I might hate Tom last, and then it started with Tom Pabay, and I was like, nah, still hate him. Still you hate him. You that, don't you? That just doesn't bother me. I'm all for it. Go Tom Pabay. <laughs> the worst. The absolute So worst. bad. Anyway, it was, it was The Rock who changed it to, like, Tofu Bay or something. It's his, it's his originally. <laughs> Tampa Bay Tofu, that was it. <laughs> Yum. <laughs> All right, guys, so let's talk about the impact of coronavirus on the game. So this has changed many things. Um, God, where do we start on it? Let's maybe start with the NFLPA. Um, So their board voted in favour of not playing any preseason games ahead of the 2020 season. So the vote came as a result of a discussion with the union leadership um, on whether it was basically smart to play any preseason games, basically. And they decided that, uh, yeah, it by not having it, they've got a longer, I guess, longer lead up to the actual season. Um, yeah, I mean, where do we start on that? Do we, I mean, I'm still of the view that I don't think the season's going to start on time, if at all. Um, yeah, go for it. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I agree with you there. I think that it's my personal view, and this is just my personal view, that they're just prolonging the inevitable. I mean, we are going to get, and I know we're going to talk here in just a little minute about college postponing and high school postponing and all these other things. I think there's this domino effect that's going to happen. um, And they're just kind of postponing the inevitable. So the players, you're right, that the NFL wanted to do two preseason games. The players said no preseason games, which turns the first half of the season into a giant preseason. I, I don't even know, you know, and and then it comes in, we, we, we've we been talking about how, would you have an entire second team on the practice squad in case your whole entire, you know, position group goes down? I, I don't know. So there's so many things that have to deal with this. But I think what we need to focus on when it comes to here is how ready will they be? They want an extended camp is basically what they're saying. And so that they can control the situation within their team better. They can bubble them a little bit more. They can do more uh, regular testing. They're not going in head to head with other teams as early. And I think they're trying to push back that exposure level. Makes sense to me. I get it. Um, Unfortunately, what that's going to do is it's going to hurt your rookies because they won't have, you know, proper NFL introduction at all in any way, shape, or form. Um, Because I promise you, you know, if you have a preseason game, the, you're and you're saying, oh well, they have their scrimmages against their own team. Their players are not hitting them as hard as another team. Well, I mean, come on, that's just logic. Yeah. So oh I think that I understand why the players are doing it, but again, I, I don't know that it's going to help. I don't think it's going to change the outcome. Which for me, I think we have about a fifty-fifty chance of having a season at all, and I think we have about an eighty percent chance of the season starting and stopping and not continuing so yeah because yeah. haven't a lot of teams have to pull out of the mls tournament because yeah um, because there's going to be a second team today i think nashville pull out today so yeah so mls for um our uk listeners they are doing a tournament down in orlando where it's 100 degrees every day i don't know <laughs> that was a and, good a, and also a surge in coronavirus yeah, it, I don't, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. so, makes total sense <laughs> On the Disney property, there is the ESPN Wide World of Sports Complex. And I've been there a couple years in a row covering the Pro Bowl because that's where they have the Pro Bowl pack practices. This place is huge. And I get why they wanted to do it. They can have an entire, you know, state or hotels to themselves. I get it. Um, but already they're seeing problems with that bubble where it's completely controlled all in one space. The NBA just arrived there too because they're planning on doing the same thing. Um, the Dallas, um, MLS's team in Dallas had to pull out cause they have nine positive Corona, uh, pay, uh, tests My goodness. and they were already in Orlando when they had those. And now Nashville has the same amount. So they're probably going to have to start to pull out. And I said, this MLS tournament and this NBA tournament is going to set the tone for what happens in the NFL, yeah. because if they can't control it in that tight of a setting, it'll be impossible to control for the NFL. Yeah. So I think we're going to kind of see how that goes. I think the next 20 to 30 days is going to be very telling. Good, yeah, definitely. I just, I just think it's wild anyway. And like you said, if they're not controlling in, in that kind of setting, well, then 
there's literally no chance <laughs> agreed yeah i mean so in scottish football are they are trying like really hard to get friendlies before the season starts so the season starts here in august um because obviously like they are back training but all the managers are saying we can't just go back go into a full season without having at least some sort of competitive game to see what what our our new sightings are like how we're going to gel as a team um we have obviously been doing games of like 11 v 11 with our own squad but like as you say it's not the same as when you face other other teams so they've been trying to do like little like pocket games like of teams nearby where they do like friendlies but it's proving really tough because they want to do friendlies against teams who might not be back in training yet and then you have this whole debacle here so I just don't see how I just don't think it's effective to not have a preseason. Well, and look at what about undrafted free agents? What about what your rookie? Look, I, I think about undrafted free agents or, uh, you know, let's put it this way, because most of the people know that we are Seahawks fans. If Russell Wilson had had a preseason, he would not have been the starting quarterback, exactly. you know? And so how many other people is that going to affect all those undrafted free agents who just got a camp invite? That's all they got. You know what I mean? And so it, it, there's such a huge effect. And yes, it's one year. But in football, that makes all the difference sometimes. So we'll see what happens. And then what's this that you – so we were chatting earlier before the show. Um, you mentioned about players having the ability to sign out of a season. So um, if for Major League Baseball, we have had – who is restarting up their season, they or they're starting their season. They never got it started before. Um, they gave their players options to opt out of the season for whatever they decided. Either they just didn't feel safe or they had a you know immunocompromised family member that lived in their mm-hmm. home or, or whatever it may be. They gave them the chance. And there was a lot – quite you know a number of players that that decided to do that and some pretty big names that has also happened in mls so carlos vela who is probably the star of mls he plays for lafc he was like i'm out i'm not doing this i'm not going to risk being sick and maybe endangering the rest of my career for this season so there has been talk that players have also then nfl players um also will have the option to not play and Malcolm Jenkins is one of the players and he's already said he's not playing this season he's just not going to do it and so then it, it kind of goes to if you have enough players who decide not to do that then that compromises the entire team and so is is it really logical to continue at that point and so it'll be interesting to see how many of those players if they require preseason if they aren't controlling it if the testing isn't available or as as quick as they want it to be how many players will decide not to do it yeah, that'd be interesting because that, I assume, means they don't get paid, right? Or do they? Well, I don't know how this means... works because this is the whole <laughs> contract's crazy. It, it, <laughs> and that and that is the other thing. The NFLPA is very busy right now. Yeah, so yeah. <laughs> the other thing is, you know, NFL, um, the owners asked to take about 35% of the player salaries and put them in escrow, which escrow is the wrong word, and I explained that before, but it's it, <laughs> they basically want to hold on to it to help pad for lost revenue. Yeah. So already you want them to put their, their health at risk to play a game probably without fans. 99% of it will be yeah. without fans. I'm sure of it. And now you want them to make less money for that. Well, no, that doesn't make sense. And so then you have to, that's where the preseason game comes in. Cause you have to do the TV rights and how much they'd make off of that versus the, I mean, it's so complicated that's when I'm like, just call it a day and start again next year. Just be done. Yeah. And I guess this moves us on to the whole, you know, the colleges and things like that. Who basically, you know, they're making that step to cancel their sports and things like that. So the Ivy League, they announced that they've cancelled all competitive sports until January 1st. So they're the first NCAA Division One um, conference to, to do that, basically. Um and they'll make the decision, I guess, I think maybe around springtime next year if they're going to actually do something, like actually go ahead of the season. So that's pretty crazy. And then obviously, yeah, <clears throat> I say they've suspended all of their voluntary workouts because <laughs> I guess they've had quite a few people test positive for COVID. So, um, yeah, and then, yeah, I mean, where, where, do, where do you start on that? You just, it's not going to work. 
I, I just don't think it is. And I, and I, sorry, I feel like I've dominated the conversation, but <laughs> no, no, go for it. <laughs> is United States based, but so there, there's a couple different levels here. When you look at sports in America, everything starts at the high school level and at, at football, it starts at Texas high school football level. You guys, I, I don't know if people in the UK know this, but in Texas, they have 100,000 people stadiums for high school football. This, wow. uh, there, there was, there was this great tweet I read that said, if you ask text people from Texas, it, tell them they had to either give up church or football, 90% of them would give up church. I mean, that's just the way it is. They, the football is life down there, especially in high school. And you can go through the NFL and look at how many kids come out of Texas football to make it to the <laughs> NFL. It is kind of the breeding ground of all of it they came out and said, there's a very, very high chance, like very high chance. Texas is not going to have high school football. I'm telling you that is a seismic shift. You have no idea. <laughs> like it's just huge. And so it won now that the Ivy league has already pulled all their fall sports and Texas is thinking they're not going to have football. You have Nebraska, K state, Ohio state, all these people stopping their practices because they have have 20, 30 people coming up positive for COVID just from practice. Yeah. I, I just don't see. And so I think that's going to end up forcing the NFL's hand to a certain extent. Because if college doesn't, you know, if they don't play this year, how do you have a draft? And how do you, yeah. like, there's so many, you know, repercussions of this. Again, mm-hmm. that's when I come back and say, call it a day and start again next year. I, I think that that's just going to be safest for everybody. And you guys know I love football, so it's not easy exactly, to Exactly, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I've worked in healthcare for a lot of years, and so in my, in my brain, I think that it's just the most logical answer. I feel like, especially with the, the surge in cases in, in pockets in the States, I feel like that's the issue because right now it's, it's being contained in obviously these pockets, but if you do that away games where the team has to fly – you just don't like it, it takes one person one one it was it one in one person can infect eight or something with this yeah. disease like yeah so if you're it's it becomes difficult because there's a lot of away games to be played in the season um i just don't I, it's so difficult because everyone wants sport back properly and everyone wants to be in the stadiums and see their team play and you know, I want to see Russell in one of his prime years of his life, like in his career, but I might have to miss out on it. <laughs> like, yeah. It's, um, yeah, it's really tough. I just think because of it, because it's so still so topsy turvy with second waves. And even if we've, I don't even know if we've exited the first wave yet. People say the second, but is really the end of the first. Yeah. I think it's better safe to, like you say, just kind of call it, but it is sad. So the interesting thing, there was a point made this morning, it was on ESPN, and they said that the biggest problem with the college level is that there's no one true governing chancellor, one one leader. You know, when you come down, it's every little, you know, conference, you know, you have the ACC, you have the Big Ten, you have the 12, you know, there's all these different, and they all control themselves. So there's no control over what, you know, this team might do against this team, you know, for their precautions versus this. And so it just makes it too difficult at that, at that where, you know, at, in NFL, yeah. Roger Goodell makes the rules, all the teams have to follow it. But then again, every state is different and there's just, it's just, it's just so much. So yeah. it'll be interesting to see what happens. And we're now seeing, which I think we're going to talk about in a minute, yeah. teams are starting to react to that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, so, so um, you know, we heard the Ravens and Chiefs, they've both said that they're going to defer all their season tickets from uh, this year to next, and they're only going to sell single-game tickets. So I think that will be interesting. So obviously they've got to deal with this whole capacity issue and that you can't, you know, have people sitting next to each other. That's just not going to work. But I just, I don't know. I mean, I still don't think there's a way to have a game in a stadium with fans there and for it to be safe. Mm-hmm. I don't think that's possible. Um, but it is interesting that some of the teams are actually making those kind of steps to protect the fans and, I guess, protect their seats or <laughs> whatever it is they're saving. I, I think it's the seats. But, yeah, I mean, I just think it's it's the right move for teams to be making. But I don't know if all teams are on board with that. Mm. 
or if the NFL is quite so prepared for that. Surely, um, with this whole track and trace thing, it would be easier to have season tickets because then if, if somebody did get it when they were in a game, then you could tra- trace it to their ticket. Whereas having single, single ticket games, I think would make it more improbable, would it not? It, it would be d- more difficult. So the, the, the releases that came out of those two teams, and I think that the Giants maybe have also said something similar to this, was that they're just going to move all the season ticket holders, they're going to move their, all their credits to next year. They're refunding any season single tickets that have already been bought. So, because they're, they're worth, like the Chiefs sold single tickets to all their games. So yeah. they have, re, they're going to refund that. If they're allowed to bring fans in, it will, they've already said it will, without question, be at limited capacity and that they will resell single tickets. So that then Ticketmaster is getting involved logically, which is brilliant. And they're plotting out how far apart everyone can be and how many people they can actually fit in there. The problem that is going to come of that is people staying where they're supposed to sit. There'll be no alcohol sales. They've already said that because, you know, people get stupid when they drink. And (laughs) there's no tailgating. Do we? um, And there'll be no tailgating. How do you then control that? How do you control no tailgate? Come on. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. And you know what? Unless Unless they really... You know, if they, you know, tell their fans, if you want to come, these are the rules. You have to follow them and then threaten to ban them. I don't know what else you could do at that point. And football yeah. fans are, we have such a large, diverse football fan base. So you know, <laughs> that's, that that's going to be the problem is it, it would just be easier. They've already decided they're going to block off the first 10 rows. The NFLPA wants 30 rows, um, much wow, like okay. the European soccer leagues have, and they've sold advertising on those charts. Yeah, so that they yeah. can do that. And, but at this point, I just don't see how it's going to happen, period. Um, I have season tickets to MLS for, to Sporting Kansas City here in Kansas City. And we got an email yesterday that basically said, you know, here's the deal. We probably aren't going to see you. So your tickets are going to go to next season. And, you know, if we can get you in a stadium, we, it'll be a lottery. And I don't know that we're going to be able to do that. Well, that is soccer. And that's so like our stadium holds 22,000 people. Our soccer stadium. What do you do with sixty five thousand people? Yeah, Seventy thousand. Exactly, yeah, it just, it's not as logical. Just like thinking like the the logistics of it. Anyway, like I just, I don't, I I can't actually picture like <laughs> it's, it's like planning a wedding and all table seats thing. But like at a game like this, like ha- I mean, I guess they'll know this from season tickets whether you're a family of four or not. Like, what if your your down as tickets are four, but actually you're two separate families from two different households, kind of thing, like. Yeah. I just don't, I don't know how they're going to do it. And the biggest thing is how are you going to get them all in the stadium without yeah. them lining up and six feet in between? And how do you police that? And yeah. then there is the liability, you know, in the United States, people love to sue. Oh my God. Them. Yeah. <laughs> and so, Oh, I went to a football game and you promised that we would be distanced and we weren't. And now I'm sick. So now I'm suing a team. I don't know if they want that liability. There'll be waiver forms and all sorts. Like you give up your right to sue by just being in this building. <laughs> Give up your right to breathe to walk in the stadium. <laughs> exactly. You're selling your soul. <laughs> yep. They go your rights. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> awesome. Well, um, yeah, I want to know from you guys. I have one question from you guys. So, for you guys. So, looking at, you know, the way sports have been going in your, you know, in the UK, um, you know, it seems to be you know, the soccer league seem to be doing pretty well. You know, they, you guys, someone said, well, they're used to not having fans in the stand because that's how they get in trouble in their league because they ban <laughs> fans, which I thought was hilarious. I had no idea. But so. We do. But, uh, odds. We do. <laughs> I know. That's a, like that team gets in trouble. They lose their fans, which I thought was just clever. Yeah. But, you know, <laughs> I, I don't think that I, I wonder how it's perceived that the U.S. is even trying to pull this off. How is that perceived on your guys' end? Um, I well, I mean, I think because it's kind of the thing is the UK is a lot smaller, so we've managed to we've managed to do it because like we have way, way, way less people than the US. Like, yeah. <laughs> um, and also every team. So I know from the from the Premier League and the Scottish Premiership for for them to be able to play, they've had to have a testing. Um, 
facility in place. So a lot of clubs have bought one and they're doing their own testing. A lot of them are doing um, outfield testing. The problem is with that is that the obviously the Scottish Premiership and the Premier League are very wealthy leagues. When you filter yeah. down to the lower divisions, they can't afford that, let alone can't even yeah. afford to play without fans coming in. So in that scale, it works in the sense of, yeah, okay, great, we're getting Premiership and Scottish Premiership football. But for someone like me, who I've always been brought up watching Highland League football, I don't actually know when that's going to be able to come back because my like home team of Fraserburgh, they don't have any money like they're not a wealthy club yeah. like they play part-time football it's guys who play who work as a joiner or a fisherman or whatever and then they play football part-time on a Saturday yeah. um so it's things like that that I think would also hinder in the U.S. as well like you know you have wealthy teams who can put all these implications in place but then what do you do when you know you have that lower lower level of team that was small market teams Mm -hmm. yeah that wants to get the small market teams who also want to play and also want to get their fans back in i think it's ambitious (laughs) (laughs) that's a nice way to put it (laughs) i think it's ambitious um and i don't see it panning out the way they hope but i could be wrong i don't know i just don't see it i just don't i just don't see a season which is heartbreaking to me Liz, do you see a season? I just don't see a season. I, no, I don't I don't see a season. I've, I think I've said that pretty much from the beginning, um, probably the beginning of lockdown. I think in my head I thought, oh, it's going to get pushed back to November, but it'll happen. And then just as it comes on, I think, just don't do it. It's not, it's, it's not worth the risk, surely. Mm-hmm. Like, it's just not worth the risk. As much as we would all bloody miss it, like, it's not worth the risk. <laughs> then you I'm also sorry. have the implications, though, like, if you don't, run a season or attempt to run a season they have these multi-million deals with sports companies who then in turn won't so the leagues will suffer the media companies will then suffer and then it can lead to other job losses so it's kind of like a domino effect it's like how do you manage it because yeah from the fans point of view you want it back but also from an economy and a financial point of view you want it back yeah but well, that's it. There's already been loads of job losses at like the NFL itself. But when as soon as like coronavirus happened, exactly like you say, Shona, like it's gonna impact everyone else. Like the media people that we're used to seeing, they'll, they'll be have like they'll have no job basically for a, a season or whatever. And I don't know. It, it's just it's a, yeah, it's a domino effect, like you said. It just sucks. That's it does suck. It. it just sucks. <laughs> it's ambitious and it sucks. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> Well, cheers to it sucks. <laughs> yeah. Cheers. We all need a drink. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> That's all for this week's episode of Gridiron and Wine. Thank you to everyone for tuning into our podcast. If you liked what you heard, be sure to rate, review, subscribe, and of course, tell a friend about the show. Until next time, thanks for listening. <laughs> <laughs>